I entered the game at 17, determined to carve my name on it. Though playing for England was an Everest-like image, peeking through the clouds in the distance. Yet, there I was, shaking the hands of Virat Kohli, India captain and national hero, and feeling real warmth and a rare sense of affinity from the capacity crowd. Nervous? Of course. The only antidote was an immersion in familiar virtues. I'm not big on slogans, but over the years, I was determined to be the best version of me that I could be. No gimmicks, no fashion statements, no borrowed habits. I took my usual guard, two, or middle and leg. Then, a reminder of the basics. One of the tricks to opening the baton for England is to play the next ball as if the last one never happened. Watch the ball. And this is an excerpt from the book we're going to talk about today, Sir Alistair Cook, The Autobiography. Welcome to Performers, the podcast that takes you into the minds of the world's most extraordinary athletes, coaches, and performers. We're your host, I'm Dr. Duncan Simpson, and you've just heard from Dr. Greg Young. A sports psychology expert will guide you through the pages of their autobiographies, revealing the mindsets, strategies, and habits that propel the world's best to the pinnacle of their field. Our goal is to help you learn from history's greatest performers. For each episode, we read and condense entire autobiographies into concentrated insights representing over 20 hours of work per episode. You gain not only the collective wisdom of these elite performers, but also access to over 30 years of our professional expertise in sports psychology. Listening to this, you are saving countless hours while accessing the distilled wisdom and proven strategies of the best in the field. So Greg, we now have listeners in over 50 countries around the world, but I know we have a lot of listeners in the US, so I'm sure many of them have never heard of Sir Alistair Cook or know much or anything about cricket. But for me, this podcast isn't so much about the sport itself, but rather about the lessons that you can learn from history's greatest performers. So why don't you tell us a little bit about his accomplishments? This isn't a lesson in cricket. It's only an hour and a half, two hour podcast. So we have good enough time to go through all the rules of cricket. Um, but yeah, we're looking at one of the best to play. It's certainly one of the best for England. So here's a little bit about his test cricket career. So test cricket being the long version of the game, the one that the one that's played over multiple days. Uh, so he was England captain uh, of the England test cricket team from 2012 to 2016. He accumulated 12,472 runs in test cricket. That puts him fifth all-time highest scorer. He recorded 33 test centuries. That means he scored 100 runs in an inning, ranking him amongst the top century makers in test cricket, tied 10th for all time. He played in 161 test matches, which is a record for England. And probably most importantly for us Englishmen, he led England to Ashes series victories, including the 2013 and 2014 series, the Ashes being the, uh, the biannual competition against the Australians. In 2011, he was the International Cricket Council Test Player of the Year. He was in the ICC World Team of the Year five times, three times as captain. He was awarded the OBE, which is the Order of the British Empire, in 2014 for his services to cricket. And in 2020, he was knighted for his contributions to cricket. And that is why we know him as Sir Alistair Cook. Quite a list there, Greg. Quite a list there. Very, very accomplished man. So are we going to jump into it? Let's go. I'm ready. Wonderful. So we're actually going to jump right into his education at the private school, what is known in England as a public school. I know that sounds a little bit uh, counterintuitive, but the, pr the public school of St. Paul's Cathedral Choir School. Suddenly, I was alone. My parents said their farewells, turned and were gone. My companions, as I sat on my bed at the dormitory at St. Paul's Cathedral Choir School, were a brown teddy bear and a soft rubber cube, which I would gnaw when I was nervous and throw at the wall when I needed catching practice. I was aged eight. I felt awkward, confused, horrible. When I started to cry, someone asked me whether I was homesick. No, I'm not sick of home, I replied with childish logic. I want to go home. I would never want my children to experience that feeling. But there is absolutely no doubt the experience made me the cricketer I became. It was pretty brutal. There was no gentle transition to this other world, just immediate immersion in the disciplines of our new craft. We were expected to learn quickly about the power of concentration and performing under pressure. So Duncan, he's thrown into this new world uh, by himself as an eight-year-old with no support and he's essentially got to sink or swim here. We've previously discussed performers who grew up in working class, even poor circumstances and how that environment really shaped and impacted who they are. This is the exact opposite to that. So what effect do you see this having? Well, Greg, as a father to myself, this sounds horrific to me and I couldn't imagine anything worse, to be honest. And you're right, it's stark contrast to the working class or underprivileged backgrounds we've heard in you know episode seven with Mike Tyson and 
last episode is Simone Biles, episode 20, where with the both of them, resilience was built gradually. Here, the pressure to perform is both immediate and it sounds very intense. So what strikes me most is actually that absence of a family support system because it's a boarding school. He's been sent away by his family. And I say sent away in a horrible way, but it doesn't mean his family are a bad family. He, he obviously was sent to boarding school. And granted, he credits this experience with helping him develop into an elite performer, probably because he was forced to develop that focus, being able to perform under pressure and resilience skills all on his own. He didn't have that support system in place. But this intense pressure for me, without that emotional support, inevitably raises questions, kind of how will it impact his well-being in the long term? You're right. It is interesting. He's being sent away. That sounds that sounds like a bad thing, but it's obviously a very privileged position to be in to be able to attend one of these schools. And I did mention it was a choir school. So he goes on to talk about how singing in the choir had such an impact on his cricket. Music was similar to cricket in that we were judged collectively, but vulnerable to individual error. I wasn't phased by the more important concepts or the pomp and ceremony of certain services. I was the workhorse, the guy who rarely took solos, never got ill, and sang consistently to an acceptable standard. All good preparation for professional sport, where coaches love the player they can rely on, rock solid, without being exceptional. So he talks a little bit more about how he developed his sporting skills at home. He says, management specialists love to talk about success leaving clues. And it's certainly true that talent has a traceable timeline. Mum remembers me pestering her with a softball when I was not much older than two. She'd break off from the washing up and throw it at me across the kitchen with the promise I'd get a biscuit if I caught it at the furthest point in the room. It was only later that I realised she'd throw that ball a little bit harder when the treat was due. It, I wasn't deterred. I'd sit in the floor of my bedroom with my head resting against the side of the mattress, throwing and catching the ball off the ceiling, walls and furniture. I was unconsciously developing hand-eye coordination. He stole your line, Duncan. It seems like plenty of our performers learn important lessons they can apply from outside of their primary pursuits. Sir Alistair Cook, great cricketer and thief, I will say. <laughs> it's, it's amazing how outside experiences of one's area of focus can actually play a really crucial role in developing essential skills. So in his case, singing in the choir taught him teamwork, consistency and performing under pressure, which... Teamwork is not something I'd have really associated with choir, if I'm honest. Not that, I'm, not that my knowledge of choir is particularly high, but there you go. I've heard you sing. It's not the greatest thing in the world, so I'm <laughs> glad you didn't subject other people to it. No, I'll keep that to myself. Yes, please do. But being part of a group where, as he mentions, individual errors impact the collective outcomes mirrors the dynamics of cricket incredibly well, which make him really dependable and a resilience player on the field, as he mentions. And honestly, I think it's just another great reminder that our mindsets don't just stay on the field, the pitch or the court. It goes with us. So if we're open minded, we can use our mindset in really diverse ways. That's a great way to put it. We exist in many, many different contexts and that mindset and those skills that we take transcends those different contexts, uh, different contexts. That's, that's a great takeaway. So here he is talking a little bit about practice and learning. He says, I'm a diligent learner, though. If I was to practice daily for a week, I could probably get the whole song off pat. There's an ethereal quality to the best choirs, a natural ease and beauty. I'm not sure you can say the same about my batting, though. Though I do consider myself a natural batsman in that I'm largely self-taught, in the choir, I read the notes. At the crease, I watched the ball. I've scored runs at every level because I have an ability to play every ball on its merits, no matter how daunting the occasions. I've never felt overawed and, as strange as it sounds, can almost sight-read the bowler. Don Bradman famously hit a golf ball with a stump for hours in his backyard. My classroom, in a cricket sense, was the 11-yard pitch in the back garden. We taped up tennis balls or used slightly softer practice balls with a seam known as incredible balls. Adrian, as the eldest brother, demanded to bowl. Lawrence, as the youngest, kept wicket. I batted and was highly competitive. Adrian, naturally, tried to knock my head off. He was quick for his age, and because the pitch was so short, he would never let me play a drive. If I did so and hit the greenhouse at extra cover, we'd all get in trouble. The ball would come through at me at hip height. That's why and how I learned to play my trademark shots. The cut, the pull and the clip. I was small and lacked power, but my technique was good. Occasionally, I pretended I was Brian Lara. As a bowler, I tried to mimic Darren Goff, Angus Fraser and Gladstone, no neck small. But when Adrian raced in from the patio, the challenge was realistic because it was so personal. This was brother against brother, him versus me. I love the individual battle in cricket. 
within the team context. Duncan, some people might just see this as mucking about with brothers in the back garden, but this is simply practice. Exactly. This is practice in the most natural and effective form, if I'm honest. What might seem like a bit of fun with his brothers to me, Greg, in the back garden is actually the, a perfect example of that concept we've talked about, deliberate practice, and it's really focused practice. It's a reminder to me that sometimes the best practice happens outside of formal settings. So in these moments that seem like play, he's actually forging the skills of a great performer. He talks about how his technique developed based on what his brother was doing. So a, a further reflection I had when I listened to this, the shape and size of many backyards probably provided those natural constraints to many games that we played and the scoring systems we employed, to be honest. And then, as I mentioned, the kind of techniques we used because of the size and shapes of gardens. As he mentioned, Cook learned his trademark shots due largely to the games with his brothers. And I'm sure many of you listening have great memories of these backyard games. And this section definitely made me feel a little bit nostalgic, thinking back to the games that I played in the back garden as a kid. And also, it felt a little sad because I'm worrying, I'm worried that the professionalization of youth sports and structured practices may take away from this kind of natural form of practice in the back gardens that many of us grew up playing there was definitely nothing professional about me and my brother Stephen playing cricket in the back garden with a, <laughs> with a men's bat that was definitely too heavy for me in an upturned bin at the bottom end and I remember him whipping balls past me in the <laughs> in the back garden um, so yeah imp imprinted in my memory so he, he develops a real love of cricket and begins to play more and more competitively and he's starting to play way above his age group level as he is talented you don't often see the bigger picture when you're 10 and aware of people saying you have real talent I played for the under 11s at 8 and scored 50 for the Malden Thirds when I was 11. I was too young to regard failure to score runs as an educational experience. Perspective comes later, when you realise there'll be days when you dominate the bowler, and days when he dominates you. The important thing was that I played a lot of cricket because I wanted to, rather than being made to. Duncan, there's clearly a love of the game here. How important is that for the developing performer? Well, I'll start with, by the way, 50 at under 11 is no small feat. Oh, that's, <laughs> Just... a decent, that's a decent knock for sure. <laughs> so how important? I'd say the love of the sport is the most important thing. Of course, we encountered Andre Agassi in episode one, who hated tennis due to the pressure that his dad put on him. But the rest of the performers that we've covered so far have spoken about a real deep love for their performance domains. So he continues to develop as a cricketer and obviously he's very talented from an early age. I was aware of a climate of expectation, but it didn't become oppressive because it wasn't generated by my parents. They cared, of course, but they never pushed me. They seemed to trust the self-reliance I'd acquired as a boarder. It wasn't quite sink or swim, but they didn't exactly rush for a life belt if I got into deep water. My own perspective of parenthood tells me such a measured detachment must be healthy. On the school circuit, there must have been more naturally gifted players emerge and break records, only to regress in senior cricket, where they seem worn down by the responsibility of meeting parental demands. If my son Jack wants to play cricket in the future, that's fine, but I will never force the game on him or renew my competitive instincts through him. All you can do is allow a young player to be himself. There's a danger across sport of academy players becoming homogenised. They're treated like protected species, nurtured in three-day England training camps at the age of 13. Talent becomes a barrier to normal life. A promising cricketer may not be allowed to play a variety of sports because of the danger of being injured in, say, schools rugby. They specialise too early and consequently lack the balance of someone who develops other skills in other sports, such as athleticism or physical resilience. They're shielded from everyday life. A boy who knows only cricket has a problem because he hasn't been given the environment. Duncan, so much to unpack here. What stands out to you? I love that little phrase he says in there talent becomes a barrier to normal life and that's such a powerful statement for me greg i think parents these days almost have to fight to preserve normality while many seem to act like these crazy youth sports schedules are like a badge of honor the, the more sports we can play the better or the the more times we go to practice the better so what really stands out is how do we 
approach development in a balanced way. And his parents really seem to have done this. They allowed him to develop that kind of self-reliance and then a genuine love for the game that we just touched on without imposing their own expectations on it. There, there is a ton in there, but that, that idea of a badge of honour for just being so hectic and so full on all the time, that is something that stands out to me too. So, of course, it wouldn't be performers without a sliding doors moment. So he's actually in school and he's sat in double physics. And <laughs> Jeremy Farrell comes in and asks if he'd fill in for the MCC first eleven. More lessons for later. In sport, the biggest opportunities have a habit of presenting themselves when you'd least expect them. Be ready for anything. Make the moment matter. The MCC captain said I'd be batting at three. I barely got my pads on before I was walking to the wicket. Someone blurted out, send them back to primary school. And I was greeted with a couple of bounces. Cricket, like other sports, is a state of mind. I could sense the tide turning in my favour as my score increased and the fielding team became more subdued. I reached my century with a shot that's daunting even for a senior pro, running down the wicket to clip the ball over mid-wicket, against the turn of an off-spinner. The match petered out into a draw, with the school eight wickets down in reply, but I felt like a winner as Mr Farrell shook my hand. I was an honorary adult for the day and allowed to enjoy the rituals of men's cricket. I sat in the away changing room, drinking beer and listened to the stories become more improbable, before they drifted off. I returned to the boarding house around 9pm, gabbled my stories to my parents and woke the next morning as a new man. Suddenly, I was a name around school. I was still a little kid, but by the following Saturday, my name was on the first team message board. Well, that one sentence, he says, be ready for anything and make the moment matter. So there's absolutely this role of serendipity that we've seen in our performance journey so far. But when you when those doors are opened, you've got to be able to walk through them, as you've said in the past. This opportunity wasn't just a match. It was also a turning point for him. And it sounds like also his identity within the school. And for me, it's a perfect example of how critical moments can shape one's career. And for him, it's definitely that launching pad as he now sees himself as a senior cricketer. So obviously he begins to make a name uh, for himself in the sport and obviously in school too. Um, while playing for Essex Seconds as a 15-year-old, and there's a little bit of a whisper here that Nottinghamshire, who is a county cricket team, which is professional cricket, they were after him. They were looking at him as a junior. All the while he's performing well, he's also experiencing fear regarding his performances, something that really sticks with him through his whole career. He says, I don't consider myself insecure for recognising my fear of failure. Doubt has always been there, but manageable. Motivation for the extra batting sessions or the early morning runs varies. For some, it's the prospect of adulation, basking in the crowd's warmth as they walk off, bat up, helmet removed to reveal a reddened face and sweat-streaked hair. There's nothing wrong with that sort of egotism. It's earned and it's legitimate. Sometimes the exuberance of the celebration is a sign of relief, an acknowledgement of the inner struggle. Everyone loves a pat on the back, but I was simply driven to do it all again the next day. Success counts for nothing if it's not repeatable. That's what made me train harder than anyone in my generation. Wow, Duncan, a fear of failure is often seen as a bad thing and we've talked about it as a bad thing on, on previous episodes. It doesn't sound like that's the case here though. You're right. While fear of failure can be viewed negatively, in this context, it seems like it's really the driving force for him rather than a hindrance to his performance. His recognition of doubt and fear didn't paralyze him. Instead, it fueled his relentless pursuit of excellence so this framing of fear, Greg, when managed properly, can be a powerful tool for continuous improvement, focus, and maintaining peak performance. It's a consistent reminder that even the best of us can have fear and still excel. Sounds like you're talking about using that fear as a tool as opposed to a weapon against us. So let's introduce our listeners to the companion Alistair Cook will have with him for his entire cricketing career, the GIMP. My breakthrough moment as a young pro was discovering the meaning of mental toughness. It involved dealing with the gimp, the bloke on my shoulder who loved to beat me up in moments of difficulty. The day I learned to live with him and not become too down on myself was a massive turning point in terms of my career's longevity. This is not the it was better in my day rumination of an old pro, but I watch some young county cricketers train today and wonder whether they appreciate the privilege of the life-changing opportunity they've been given. Why wouldn't you do more than a standard session between nine and lunchtime? Why wouldn't you do that little bit more than the next man? God-given talent offers no insurance. Will you fulfill your potential if you've half an eye on that afternoon on the golf course or the session on the sofa playing FIFA with your mates? Cricket has rewarded me with everything I have. There are no shortcuts. 
so we've, we've obviously heard from other performers in the past about the merits of hard work and effort. And I'd love you to reflect here and maybe you can also comment on any experiences you've had with a GIMP. <laughs> That's for a whole other episode. That <laughs> whole other episode, whole other podcast. I don't know if I'm ready for that one. Uh, it's not. It's not the. It's not the game part of Pulp Fiction. I it's not the, uh, Yeah. <laughs> so, so for context, the the idea of the gimp on your shoulder is really that metaphor. I think Greg for that inner critic. God, I hope it's a metaphor. <laughs> <laughs> it's a metaphor for the inner critic and self-doubt, which is incredibly powerful. For me personally, the inner critic really came out for me on every single run that I ever had when I was training for marathons. How about yourself? Yes, definitely during running. Um, never been the fittest person in the world, even when I was playing reasonably competitive football. And the gimp, as it were, that voice, that devil on my shoulder, always popped out during during fitness tests and any sort of endurance stuff. I was was pretty good in performance, but any time I had to prove myself physically in that sense, yeah, the, uh, the gimp came out and he had a loud hail sitting on my shoulder. Cook is really saying, look, that inner critic is with all of us and it's about how do we manage that throughout our career, recognizing that it's there and, and how do we just quieten it down at key moments? So he continues to rise through the ranks of cricket and gets into the England setup and he quickly establishes himself as a captain at the Under-19 World Cup in Bangladesh in 2004. And he says about that tournament, despite the lack of essentials, it was an invaluable four-week crash course in team building and personal resilience. We should have done better versus the West Indies in the semi-final, but cracked under the pressure and were bowled out for 155. It demonstrated how much I had to learn about both group dynamics and individual obligations. We were so far from being the finished product. But also during this time of struggle, he's starting to begin to really understand the importance of mentality and will. He says, the Aussies call it ticker. Have you got the heart to withstand tough periods when your character is under scrutiny? Can you get through by sheer force of will? You can't replicate a critical game situation in practice, but that old cliche about the tough getting going when the going gets tough has more than a hint of truth. Guys who are genuinely successful tend to be the ones who put themselves through sessions no one sees. And he goes on to talk about his approach to developing himself here. He says, I prefer to train early in the morning. My routine at home is to get up at half past five, do some gym work, and then run around the lanes between six and seven. It's a quiet time of day, an absorbing and strangely intimate process. I'm proving myself to myself, if you like. I could easily lie in, do the workout mid-morning, but there's something about being out there on your own, not really wanting to be there, knowing you're ready to do the hard stuff. I'm not comparing myself to a Martin Johnson who led England's World Cup winning rugby team by the power of example, but I suppose they picked me as an inexperienced captain of the under-19s for the same reasons that they asked me to lead the full team. People probably respected the way I went about things. There were no great secrets to my approach. I worked hard put myself on the line by opening the button, I topped the fitness tests, I wanted others to have the same drive, and people seem to listen to what I said. I've used the saying before, actions express priorities. And right here, he's telling us, what are your priorities? He's getting up early, he's putting in the hard yards, and he just sounds like he's being a pro, really at the under 19 level, and he just carries that all the way through. It's not fancy, but it's effective. And there's the old saying, Little by little, a little becomes a lot. And that's what he's doing. It's just consistency, time after time. As he says, there's no secrets here. He's not doing anything fancy. He's just putting in and doing the things that are required to make him an elite performer. There's not some magic pill here, some great no. revealed wisdom that he's putting out there. We talk, I love that. A little by little, a little becomes a lot. That's a really great one. Listeners, make sure you write that down somewhere, stick that in your phone. That's really the essence of discipline. That's when motivation goes out of the window, when you're not sure whether you can be bothered, that's when discipline kicks in. And I really like that cumulative effect. Now, of course, as with many of our other performers, Alistair Cook's very fortunate to develop a mentoring relationship. He's very fortunate that his mentor turns out to be none other than one of England's greatest batsmen and captains, Graham Gooch. He says, we all need a helping hand in various ways. Mine, in a cricketing sense, came consistently from Graham Gooch. I queued for his autograph as a child and grew up quickly because of his patronage. Sometimes, in sport, the circle of life accelerates. Gucci saw something in me, drove me hard, but looked after my wider welfare. Like my mum, he urged me to go to university instead of committing myself to cricket full time. He was a distinctive cross between an army PT instructor and a solicitor's housemaster. Once the work was done, he wanted us to clear out our minds, relax and release. He wouldn't scream at me if I got out to a poor shot. A look of piercing sadness was usually enough. He knew what I'd done. 
Why raise the temperature if you, as a coach, have faith your pupil will respond? His most persuasive method of motivation was the quiet but telling one-liner. When I got a low score, he would seek to reassure rather than accuse. We'll work hard tomorrow, he said. Don't look back. Mentors like Gooch are vital because they offer more than just technical expertise, which obviously Gooch has because he was a former great player himself. But it sounds like in this situation, he really provided that holistic support, which can significantly influence that that personal and professional growth. So he says he cared about his wider welfare, which is really important. A mentor, as you mentioned, Greg, it really can help accelerate learning, offers perspective or a different perspective and provides that emotional and psychological support. Gooch played all of these roles for Alistair Cook. Offering this balance of support and challenge really helps individuals grow into their best self. So as you mentioned, if you haven't got a mentor, look outside of your circle, find one, and start the work together. Great advice. So he goes on to talk about how Graham Gooch helped him to learn how to build an innings rather than simply on the technical elements, something you mentioned a little bit before. He used to talk about the knowledge. This encompassed the power of concentration, the importance of building a firm base before becoming too expansive. He taught me to study the weather as well as the wicket and to make sure I was mentally secure in what I was seeking to achieve. His priority was to make me play positively. He liked it when I was ambitious, looking to score runs rather than merely survive. His logic was, as usual, easy to follow. If you seek the initiative, you're transferring the pressure to the bowler. Don't give him the respite of shuffling about, soaking up 30 or 40 balls for the odd run. Work hard. Earn the right to play. Trust in your talent and preparation. Groove your movements. Pick up the line. Hit the ball back where it came from. Send the message to the bowler that you know what you're doing. Duncan, this is advice that could only come from somewhere who's been there, done that. Yeah, Greg, I've used the same before. Stop asking people for directions to places they've never been which was really in reference to people asking for advice from someone who's never been where they want to go. But here, he has someone who has been there and done it. So you have to sit up and listen. Right? He he's literally has an England captain, one of England's greatest ever batters, telling him and mentoring him through this process. Of course, you're going to sit up and listen. Now, how mentors have excelled might not actually be the best path for you, but it is still worth listening to that advice. So it's about taking in all the information, understanding how to distill it, and then picking out the bits that work best for you. That's a great point. So the destination might be the same, but the journey might be different for every single person. Absolutely. I love that. And of course, you know, the, we, the ability to play the game effectively face bowlers at the very, very highest level is the immediate challenge of any batsman. And here, Cook talks about the importance of practice. Batting is a manifestation of the mind. There were times on the Ashes Tour of 2010 and 11 and in India in 2012 where I wasn't exactly in the zone, that zen-like state snooker players speak of when everything slows down and doubts are dispelled. But I just found the rhythm. I wasn't seeing the ball better or quicker, but I had a sense of flow. When I got to the crease, it just happened for me without the battle. A particular session in Adelaide before the second test in December 2010 is imprinted on my memory. It was one of those occasions when Andy Flower consciously put us under pressure in the nets. This was the antithesis of cosy, confidence-building training. He told the coaches to discomfort us by flinging the ball aggressively, trying to find the edge or shatter the stumps. If you got in the way of one, tough. It was a reassertion of the old principle of training hard to play easy. Rotation makes the adrenaline flow. I left anything that wasn't hitting the stumps. I was driving, cutting, clipping, pulling anything that was slightly wide or short. I was surprised by the intensity of the feeling of being at ease. I wasn't forcing myself to score the runs or find the shot. Everything just happened. After 40 minutes or so, when I was error-free, Gucci came down to me and said, You're in good, Nick. Make it count. Some golfers become almost mystical when they talk about that unconscious excellence. I never allow myself to ignore the danger of getting out. But that effortlessness is seductive to any professional sportsman. I don't experience things in slow motion like others. If anything... Time goes too quickly for me. Occasionally, though, the game becomes metronomic. Duncan, again, he's stolen one of your lines here. Train hard to play easy. This is just great coaching for me, knowing what the team, and in particular, what Cook needs at this exact moment. Of course, if you don't know your athlete very well and you conduct such a session and it doesn't go well, you could kill their confidence. 
just judging by the sound of that session, you could kill them as well, let alone their confidence. <laughs> Sounds pretty intense. So we're going to we're gonna switch tone here a little bit, Duncan, because, you know, we've obviously talked there about practice. But one of the things Alistair Cook talks about at some length in his, in his book is about his teammate, Jonathan Trott, who was a, a very accomplished English player. And he has mental health issues which arise. And they're discussed in the context of his struggles with anxiety and depression during his cricket career. So Trott, again, a, a really prominent England cricketer, experienced significant psychological challenges that, that really affected his performance and his well-being, of course. So his issues came to head during the 2013 to 2014 Ashes series, leading him to withdraw from that tour to focus on his mental health. And Cook's account really sheds a light on the pressures and difficulties that Trot faced and also emphasises the importance of addressing mental health in professional sports and, of course, the broader impact that it can have on athletes in general. He says, We needed 561 runs to win the first test at the Gabba, with two more days to play. Deep down, I knew the game had long gone. But... I go through my mental checklist, promise myself I will sell my wicket dearly, I will not let them grind me down. Then, just as I'm about to walk into the cauldron, I see something so personal, so painful, and so profound that I'm shaken to the core. Jonathan Trott, due to bat at number three, is putting his pads on across the dressing room. He's welled up until he's unable to stem the flood of tears. In any other environment, I would retrace my steps and attempt to console a friend in distress. This is not the moment, nor the place, for instinctive compassion. Millions are waiting, unaware and ultimately uncaring. There's a job to be done. This may appear heartless when taken out of context, but I'm on autopilot. Sort that out. Just sort that out, I tell Andy Flower, our head coach. I've got to go out and bat. I don't care if he doesn't bat. You make that decision. I'll go out there with Michael Carberry, who's making his Ashes debut. I owe it to him to normalise abnormality. 18 minutes later, he's bowled by Ryan Harris from the 14th bowl he's faced. 560 runs to win with nine wickets left. I look back and see Trotty walking towards me. It's only later that I will truly appreciate the poignancy of the moment, the moral courage it took for him to attempt an innings that bordered on self-sacrifice. It must have been horrendous for him. It's unthinkable that a game you love so much represents such a threat that you don't want to expose yourself to the battle. I know the analogy may great in such sensitive circumstances, but that's what test cricket is, a battle. For someone of his talent to shy away from the challenge he'd confronted so well, so often, ask questions of us all. We all balance competitive intensity and personal welfare. We all understand the parameters of professionalism. We all admit to ourselves that we all occasionally exceed sensible levels of commitment. We all knew instinctively that Trotty was in a bad way. Wow, um, Duncan, there's a, there's a lot there and he's acknowledging the tough situation that obviously Jonathan trots in but chooses to focus on his own performance in that moment and what he needs to do in order to contribute. Is this a cold way to approach things or simply is this what's needed to exceed at the highest levels of sport? It, it was tough to read and it was tough to listen to and I, I definitely felt emotions welling up in myself as, as I read that. I don't know that it's cold per se. It's a team sport and a cook is focusing on what's best for the collective group. And that involves him performing at his best for England. For additional context, you know, Trot was an amazing player and he was really in the prime of his career for listeners who don't know that, but he was suffering significantly from mental health challenges. What I love is that Cook actually acknowledges the mental courage and self-sacrifice that it took for Trot to walk out there and to face his demons. Elite performance and sport in this context, I mean, it's truly magnificent, but it harbors a dark side that we just simply can't ignore, Greg. And it definitely brought up some emotions inside of me when I was hearing that. It was a really tough one, actually, when I when I read the book and was kind of preparing the notes and stuff like that. And what are we going to talk about in this episode? I, I ummed and awed a little bit about whether to actually include this because it is it does take up quite a lot of real estate in the book. But I wasn't really sure if this is what we do on performers and whether it sort of fit what we usually choose to talk about. And it's just such an important thing to acknowledge that this is things that professional athletes go through, that the teammates of professional athletes have to go through and something that as a captain and someone who's really involved in the system. He spent a lot of time talking about this in the book, so I thought we could we could do it justice by mentioning it, mentioning it within this episode. No, you're right to leave it in, Greg. On performance, we're talking about humanity here, not just a performance domain. And many of our listeners, whether they've been impacted by mental health themselves, they'll know someone else who is. Like I said, there's a dark side to elite performance, and this is one of the dark sides. 
Um, so Jonathan Trott ends up leaving the group and the news is shared by Andy Flower, who's the coach. And Trot doesn't actually have a formal farewell. He just sort of, you know, leaves the group, as it were. But if, of course, sport is unrelenting, as we know, and the, sh- the show must go on for Cook. He's got to continue to perform because he is out there on tour. So he takes some time to reflect on the situation and his role as captain here. He says, a captain in such a terrible situation is torn between his responsibility to the group and his duty of care to the individual. The squad is the rock. The stricken player is in a hard place. I was obliged to sift through the wreckage of that test match in November 2013 for clues or slithers of encouragement. The part of my brain that deals in logic, analytical thought and reasoning was occupied by the fragile, overarching goals of the tour. The other part, more creative and focused on such things as imagination, intuition, insight and holistic thought, was devoted to Trotty's plight. In short, could I have done more to help? It's something that I wrestle with to this day. My mind keeps returning to a session with the bowling machine during a warm-up period in Sydney. It's one of my major regrets that I never stopped it. Trotty seemed to be intent on purging himself. He turned the machine up to top speed and was being hit all over the body. It was alarming, unprecedented in my experience for its willful destructiveness. I didn't have the confidence or the ability to do my job as a leader. I knew he was struggling mentally and confiding in Mark Saxby, the monsieur with whom he'd had a strong relationship, but I'd failed to appreciate the extent of the problem. In the later years of my captaincy, I would have been more forceful and proactive and demanded to be allowed into the inner circle. Trotty has subsequently admitted to me that he regrets not sharing his issues because he didn't want to burden me. That's where self-containment, encouraged and almost demanded by international sport, works against the individual. He later wrote of having his male dignity stripped away by his perceived inability to deal with the short ball. Duncan, it's, it's interesting here that we get a glimpse into into Cook's evolving leadership is, is a way to put it. It doesn't help him in this moment, but it really gives him something to reflect on to direct his later approach as a leader. So how important is it for leaders to to utilise reflection and what advice would you have for leaders on how to fully leverage reflection as a, as a useful and meaningful tool? It's a big question and a great question. We should try to do the best we can with the information we have available at the time. So for this situation, Cook wasn't privy to all the mental health challenges that Trot had, although it could be argued that had his relationship with Trot been stronger, Trot might have confided in him and maybe Cook could have done a better job recognizing some of these signs and symptoms. He saw some of it and maybe chose to ignore it in a way. Ideally, Cook could have handled the situation better, but the power of hindsight and reflection can't be understated here, Greg. There's one more thing this section points to the power of stigma as it comes to mental health. I remember at that time, this was huge news in the UK and, and around the world in the in the countries that play cricket. In the subsequent 10 years, a lot of athletes have been able to come out and speak about mental health challenges. Teams and organizations are now doing a better job of investing resources to support athletes, although we still have a long way to go. I mean, Trot was speaking to the masseur and not to a trained professional, which again indicates probably there's a a lack of expertise in that dressing room. We still have a long way to go in terms of addressing the need for mental health in elite performance domains. I I would agree. As you say, that we we have come a long way, but we haven't come far enough yet. Uh, But I wanted to to wrap up this section. Like I said, he, he, he really dedicates considerable time in the book with some of his thoughts around particularly Jonathan Trot, but just mental health and, and high performance in general. He says, I'm not qualified to talk about the intricacies of depression or to provide a clinical analysis of the condition, but any sport forces you into a negative space quite a lot of the time because you invariably fail. Athletes in all disciplines have been more forthcoming about the strain in recent years. In itself, that's unsurprising since research has suggested that on average, around 15% of athletes suffer. High achievers, high stakes, high pressure. Sport reflects the brittleness and uncertainty of life. I suppose it reflects the unspoken reality that one man's misfortune is another's opportunity. Duncan, that is really an unfortunate reality of sport and in particular elite sport. That notion of next man up, all it takes is an injury, an illness, mental health issues, or even simply a dip in performance and you can lose your position. It is. And as we mentioned, it's the sad reality. If you're not fit enough, and I say fit enough both physically and mentally to compete at the highest levels, then someone else will be. And I, I don't mean to be callous about this, but, but rather as to think about how do we support athletes, not just physically, but how do we support them mentally to be able to perform at their best? And that's obviously what we're trying to do a little bit on performance is to share some of that knowledge. 
So one of the things that I loved about this book is that Alistair Cook doesn't just lead you through a, a boring almanac. Even, you know, even people who love cricket can find cricket statistics to be the the most tedious level of tedium known to man. Uh, you know, he doesn't just go over his batting performance, which would just be torture to read. But what he actually does is he really provides a glimpse behind the process of what it is like to bat at the highest level and the challenges that face an opening batsman. So for our listeners who know nothing about cricket, you're going to hear about the process of one of the greats. And also for context, an opening batsman is that first, in baseball it would be a lead-off hitter, that you're, you're, you're potentially staying there at the crease and batting for days upon end, and your job there is to score runs and build in innings and try and stay in for as long as possible. So he actually has a, a, a wonderful title chapter, which is The Zen of Opening the Batting. And here he lays out the challenge. He says the effective distance between batsman and bowler when a ball is delivered is approximately 17.68 metres. When Shawback there releases it at around 160 kilometres an hour, there is fractionally less than four tenths of a second in which to react. Whatever you do, don't blink, because that will waste a tenth of a second. This means that in the time it takes for a hummingbird to flap its wings about 40 times or a beam of light to cover in the region of 75,000 miles, you must read the ball out of the hand, judge the line and the length, and detect, if possible, the degree of revolution. Talk about multitasking. It's not the moment to realise you left your keys in the car. Wow, I'm getting a little bit jazzed talking about cricket here. I never thought the day, <laughs> the day would come. So, uh, you know, the challenge for any opening batsman, as I mentioned, is to establish yourself in the game and, and building innings that lasts a really long time, day or two. The demands of the task are enormous as you're going to face many different bowlers bowling in many different ways over the course of a really long time. Unlike baseball, you face one pitcher, predominantly unless teams bring in relievers, in very quick bursts. The skill level required for cricket, the concentration that's required for cricket is enormous. Yeah, you're right. We're getting into the intricacies of cricket here. And for someone who grew up playing the game, I love it and appreciate the sport. Understand that many of our listeners might not, and that's okay. But you're right about the level of concentration for days and end. And it's quite incredible because not only do the bowlers change, but so does the weather and the pitch conditions, which again impacts the, the deliveries that you're going to receive. What we're really talking about here, Greg, is that ability to focus, relax, and then refocus over and over and over again. The comparisons to baseball are, of course, understandable, but each performance domain has its own unique set of challenges that performers have to understand, train for, and execute against. As spectators, we have our own preferences regarding the challenges that hold interest to us. For example, we so far covered on performers, Tennis, skiing, American football, rugby, basketball, boxing, soccer, Ironman triathlon, free climbing, ice hockey, jiu-jitsu, swimming, gymnastics. And all of these provide really unique problems to be solved and unique challenges. At the same time, there's are so many similarities that we've seen with regards to how our performers go about solving those problems from the physical and mental standpoint. Reading through that list, I forgot how eclectic we are here on performance. <laughs> We've got a little bit of something for a little bit of everyone. Absolutely. <laughs> so he goes on to talk about the unique position of being an opening batsman and what's needed to succeed in that role. He says, we're not dull, but we make a living through dependability. We live for the days when calmness settles and something intangible suggests that the scene is set for profit and plunder. There's a lot of talk about mental toughness, but what does that really mean? To me, it involves wringing the maximum out of your natural ability at the most important moments on the biggest stages. It's suited to the more literal thinker, the individual who can place an innings, good or bad, in a box and hide the key. Failure must never be allowed to fester. Wow, Duncan, I really love this simple conceptualization of mental toughness here. What's your take on a phrase that I'm pretty sure every one of our listeners is going to be familiar with? Uh, yeah, I shared this on a previous episode, and it's a working definition for me. And it's fairly simplistic, and it starts with the question, do you have the mental capabilities and skills to meet the challenges presented to you in both practice and competition on a consistent basis? And I know that sounds like a mouthful, but can you meet the challenges presented to you? If you can do that, then you're tough enough in that particular performance domain. Like I've just mentioned, there's many different performance domains, and they present different problems and there's different approaches and different skill sets needed to solve those problems. In other words, if you have the mental ability to stand up to the task at hand and execute, then for me, you're mentally tough enough. Of course, mental toughness most likely for most people is going to come into play when things aren't necessarily going your way. He says being out of form is like trying to push a concrete wall away when it's closing in and threatening to crush you. 
like some sort of fiendish ancient trap. You're out of sync, out of the pattern, something isn't quite right and your brain cannot compute. That's when the clock face seizes up. Time passes terribly slowly. It's hard work. Half an hour seems like four. This is going to sound weird, but the art of concentration is in being able to concentrate and then not concentrate on concentrating. I did so through the routine I've described previously. Play the shot, scratch the line, walk away. Sometimes I'd go down the track and indulge in gentle gardening. Most times I'd head in the direction of square leg. I'd be digging myself in, look at the crowd, allow the bowler to have his say. If I'd been beaten or had an ugly hack, I might wander down and have a chat with a non-striker, whoever it may be. We'd smile, I'd admit, that was a shit shot, and the situation would be diffused. I'd return to the crease having rationalised what I'd done and let it go. The sequence probably takes 20 seconds. I'd be consciously calm by the time the bowler turned from his mark to run in. We go again and again and again. When you're in form, it's metronomic. When you're out of form, you're fighting yourself. You start to worry about your foot position, how you've bent your knee, all the stuff you shouldn't be thinking about. If you can't get rid of that, you're in a skid that's extremely difficult to correct. Duncan, there's some really good stuff here, but it is very cricket specific. So what advice would you give to listeners who want to improve their focus during performance, actually based on Alistair Cook's approach here? It's about focus and the need to relax and then refocus. And here he's using his routine as a framework to assist this process. He's really talking about a pre-performance routine. So for any of our listeners, it's about identifying what are your task demands, what are the key things to focus on, as well as the times to relax and then when refocusing is needed. So I'll repeat that. What are your task demands? What are the key things that you're focusing on, as well as times to relax? And then when do you need to refocus? As we've mentioned in previous episodes, knowing what your attentional thieves are are also very helpful. So those are the things that tend to distract you personally. And have a refocus plan in place for as and when those things happen, because you will get distracted if your performance is longer than a few seconds. Spoken like a true sports psychology practitioner. <laughs> and, and rather fittingly, Alistair Cook is introduced to such a professional during his time with England, psychologist Mark Borden. Boards plonked himself down, and since I don't really listen to music on headphones, I steeled myself for polite conversation. He was nervous, a little too eager, and he was immediately outlining his thoughts on the relevance of his trade. To be honest, I was standoffish. I knew the advantages of training the brain, but had never really thrown myself into it. I prefer the more literal benefits of a bicep curl, bench press, or squat in the gym. The theory of sports psychology was introduced in under 19 training camps, but I still had to be convinced of its practical application. That wasn't a reflection on boards as professionalism. Skepticism is invariably deep-rooted in sport. Some of the raw, raw, happy, clappy slogans passed off as leadership maxims in the corporate world would, frankly, be laughed out of an international dressing room. I played the role of slightly sour old pro. We were about to pull up to the ground when I presented the psychologist with a challenge. I want to have more confidence. I want to feel able to back myself more. When you've watched me, come back with something that's relevant to me. No token bullshit. Duncan, what do you make of that? Well, it made me reflect a good friend of ours, Mark Campbell, once outlined the following four questions every performer should ask of their leader. And that's kind of rhetorical. And it is, do they care about me? Can I trust you? Do you know your stuff? And can you make me better? And for me, Cook is basically addressing these four things all at once. And that last one, can you make me better? It is an essential question that any coach, teacher, mental coach must be able to answer to. That's that's a fantastic breakdown. That's some great stuff from Mark there. Do you care about me? Can I trust you? Do you know your stuff? And can you make me better? That's that's quite the checklist. So he begins to work a little bit more closely with boards and finds this addition to his training really beneficial to his performance, but it took some time for him to fully open up to, to him in this role. He said no one had been less forthcoming to our team psychologist than me. But over 90 minutes or so, I opened up to him for the first time in that bar in Adelaide. I was honest about my battles with myself. Everyone talked about my mental strength, and I thought I'd cracked the most difficult aspect of the game. But I had big doubts each time I went out to bat. It was strange. For someone who consciously struggled to articulate deeper thoughts and personal motivations, the words flowed like a torrent. I admitted walking out thinking, I don't want to be here today. I can't be bothered with the effort of scoring runs. Is it normal, I asked him? It can't be, surely. It was. I relied on my natural stubbornness to get through the first half hour of an innings, when I would settle down, but the anxiety never truly left me. When I was out cheaply, I had too much time to think, because my chance to atone might take two or three days to arrive. I maintained the facade of strength, but the game regularly beat me up. 
My life as a batsman was black and white. If I scored runs, I was a success. If I didn't, I was a failure. I just offloaded. Boards explained that I'd been consumed by what I couldn't do rather than dwelling on what I could do, what I had done. He sought to reconnect me, remind me with the virtues that had made me a good player. Everyone suffers from fear and self-doubt. My values, my love of family and trust in friends were still strong. My priority was to reset and rebuild my relationship with myself. Boards asked what I wanted to achieve. That involved coming to terms with the facts of an athlete's life. The nerves would always be there. Why waste energy trying to fight them? It sounded so simple and basic. I confess that I longed to be free, to push aside the negative thoughts and be able to concentrate on the most important thing, the ball coming towards me. Commit and watch the ball. I wanted to be decisive. I wanted my battle to not be with myself, but with the opposition collectively and the bowlers individually. Board stimulated my imagination by suggesting that in those moments of respite, I should start to write down who I wanted to be, what I wanted to do the following day. How did I want to bat, knowing that the nerves would still be there nibbling at my stomach lining? The sense of liberation was immediate. I just want to score runs. I want to be able to clear my mind so I can concentrate on the ball. I want to be decisive, go out there with my shoulders back. I want to leave the ball well. I want to fight. Duncan, I appreciate that as a very, very long passage, but that is a real glimpse into the sort of things that you or I would be doing with an athlete regularly. What jumps out to you from that section? Yeah, Greg, that's a great section there. It is a long one, but just really fantastic insights into Cook's psychology. First, there's this idea of resilience, pushing through those tough moments, even when anxiety is there. It's about learning to live with those nerves rather than just trying to eliminate them. And I think a lot of people have that fallacy that they they can get rid of their emotions and just feel good all the time. Second is this shift in mindset from focusing on failures to really recognizing his strengths. Lastly, the power of visualization and setting clear intentions before going out to perform is key. So the three big takeaways here, Greg, embrace the nerves shift the focus from what's going wrong onto what's going right, and then use visualization to set a clear, positive mindset before performance. These can be used in any performance environment. Those are wonderful. I love that. That's a great breakdown. So you, you mentioned positive mindset there. Uh, it's interesting, as I noted earlier, that, that Cook had personified his negative self-talk. It was time to confront the gimp, the imaginary tormentor who'd been on my shoulder since childhood. He'd grown with me from those games in the back garden where he'd whispered idly about the shame of losing to my brothers. At that stage in our lives, though, he was a little bit more innocent, markedly less intense. Rationalising my relationship with self-doubt was the key to the longevity of my international career. I stopped stubbornly fighting it, grinding away at it. I knew the gimp would continue to play devil's advocate and attempt to sour any success. He's a cheeky bastard who won't leave you alone, a cartoon figure who dusts himself down and springs back at you when you've punched him a thousand times. Everyone has one. It's taken eight years from 2003 to understand him. I accepted him without welcoming him. It's no longer a case of fight or flight. There are days when I'm better than him and days when I go to bed angry because he's beaten me. He'll never stop telling me I've lost that everyone will notice when I don't get runs tomorrow. I've gone through a lot as a cricketer, managed to deliver decent results under intense pressure. I had a clearer mind, a rediscovered ability to concentrate completely by focusing solely on the ball and the conditions, instead of being deflected by self-imposed distractions, I began to enjoy the battle of the game of cricket. It was engrossing, fulfilling. Perversely, it's easier to talk about the negative stuff, the hard times, because the accompanying emotions are so raw that they're easily understandable. It's much harder to put into words when things go well, because the feelings are so individual and intimate. You strive to be the best you can be, knowing that you'll never play a perfect innings. You are living to gauge your responses to the game's harshness. The pressure of applying your skills in daunting circumstances is a challenge, a buzz. The feelings are irreplaceable and impossible to reproduce. That's probably why so many sportsmen struggle at the end of their career. Greg, just another fantastic section here. With regards to that kind of gimp on his shoulders, we've talked about that inner critic. One key skill that can really enhance one's self-awareness of their own mind is mindfulness that skill is something that i know that we both practice intermittently over time very intermittently yeah but but it but it is a it is a practice that can really enhance our own self-awareness of what's going on in our own head for anyone listening if you haven't started the process of mindfulness there's a ton of different resources and tools and apps and websites you can 
Google it. It's going to be there. You're going to, you're going to get something out of it. It might seem like really hard work on the front end, but stick with it. Um, I'm much like my gym work, spending a long, long time between sets, like I think you are, Duncan. But I must admit that when I do it, I do feel you feel better and more positive. I can't really put my finger on it, but it, it, has, a, it has a positive benefit for me. You, you cheeky bastard. You can't even see me. I'm, I'm all bot <laughs> these days. <laughs> Now, you know, we couldn't talk about England cricket without talking about the Ashes, as I mentioned right on the front end when we were talking about accomplishments. And it's a, essentially a series against the old enemy, Australia. It's played every two years. And the series, which dates back to 1882, is named after a satirical obituary published in a British newspaper declaring that English cricket had died and, and I quote, the body will be cremated and the ashes taken to Australia. I won't bore you with a ball-by-ball -ball account, but in 2010 to 2011, England travelled to Australia to retain the ashes. That's mean they, that means they, they won it out there. So they do go on to win the game next and win the Ashes outright. He says, There was the usual champagne-soaked scrum in the changing room before we decided to take a few beers out to the square for a debrief. We knew the symbolism of sitting in the middle, the spiritual home of Australian cricket, and events took on a life of their own. The cigars were passed around and everyone spoke from the heart about what the achievement meant to them. Sport at the highest level doesn't encourage emotional growth, but no one held back. I was in a panic when it came my turn to speak. Worried about failing to do justice to the magnitude of the moment. Somehow, I came up with the words to express the essence of being an international cricketer. Ten weeks ago, I still felt I shouldn't have been selected for this tour, I said. Four months ago, I was one in innings away from not being here. Being named man of the series, winning the Ashes, is mad. I've achieved something I didn't think was possible. We've achieved something that will be with us for the rest of our lives. So, never give up. No matter how bad it is, never give up. It will turn if you keep doing the right things. Duncan, what does this tell us about the power of shared experiences, sitting in the middle of a cricket pitch, talking in this way? Yeah, I love the phrase, and I'm not sure where I stole it from, but it's relationships rule the world. I'll say that again, relationships rule the world. Greg, I think shared experiences are really powerful because they connect us in ways that transcend individual moments. When we go through something significant with other people, it really creates a bond and makes us feel connected and part of a bigger story. These shared moments then turn into collective memories. As he says, this is going to live with us for the rest of our lives. And I think that's so cool. They'll always be bonded by that moment. So these experiences also help us see our own lives from a broader perspective. They remind us that we're not alone in our journeys, but as part of a collective story, shaping and being shaped by those around us. By sharing these moments, we gain a real deeper understanding of ourselves and our place in the world, and these experiences bind us together. And once again, I really think relationships rule the world. I love that. Again, if you've got your phone or a piece of paper around, that's another another beauty from Duncan there. So as I said, they were they were world number one, and the performance of the test side, that, that full long-form side of the game, is going well. But after some controversy with one of their top players on the team, a guy called Kevin Peterson... The test captain, Andrew Strauss, decides to step down and retire. Cook says, Flower wasted no time. Strauss is resigning the captaincy and is going to announce his retirement from the game tomorrow, he said. I'd like you to become the New England test captain. Will you do the job? <laughs> Absolutely, I replied. I'd love to. It's a huge honour. And that was that. A schoolboy fantasy reduced to a statement of the obvious. I turned to leave the room and paused before opening the door when Flower added, Don't tell anyone. And don't let it distract you from the game tonight. You've got a big game. Oh, I won't, I promised. Don't worry, I'll be on it. Of course, I got zero. Bowled second ball by Lonwabo Tsotsobe, who would go on to become a DJ after being banned for eight years in a match-fixing scandal. <laughs> Amazing. If anything shows you the power of mental preparation, this is it. He's not mentally prepared and he gets, he gets bowled out second ball by a disgraced DJ. <laughs> But more importantly, enters the role and finds that it is a huge undertaking. Probably the captaincy in cricket is probably a bigger deal in terms of what you're actually asked to do. Maybe more than any other sport, Duncan. Captaincy here is really a massive role. Yeah, for those that really don't understand cricket, cricket captains are not just the leaders on the field. They're also the strategists, the motivators, and sometimes the media is between the teams and the umpires. The, the cricket coach is up in the stands and really has very little impact on the game itself. So the captain really is the coach on the field day in, day out. He goes on to say, I had my public initiation as England captain in the arena I liked least, the press conference. 
The question I hated most arrived on cue. What leadership style can we expect from you? Put simply, it's hard to answer when you don't truly know. When you get picked for the job because people see leadership qualities in you, but it's hard to put into words beyond an appreciation of the honour and the intention to do what comes naturally. I eventually relaxed into the role after about 18 months, but was worried about how I came across as a public speaker. I panicked initially when I had to articulate ideas or strategies in front of the squad. The truth is that nothing can prepare you for the England captaincy. Experience of doing the job in county cricket might offer tactical experience and acumen, but it has limited relevance because of the magnitude of daily decisions, which are second-guessed by people with minimal knowledge of the situation. It's like a football manager walking into a changing room to address his players for the first time. He must meet questioning eyes. He knows what's going on behind those eyes. Every player is watching intently and wondering what change will mean for him. Ultimately, words are of secondary importance to actions. Duncan, one of his first decisions as captain is whether or not to bring Kevin Peterson, um, who we've mentioned there, and, and really is an absolute generational talent for anyone who knows anything about English cricket. Just an absolute maverick, the way that he played, everything that he did. He has to decide whether he brings him back into the England fold. So after a frank and honest conversation, he decides to do so, and the first two of his captaincy is in India. Duncan, I just want to share a passage where he describes the experience of playing in such a cricket-mad part of the world. So imagine being a player in this environment. Playing in India is an immersive experience, since the game drives a billion people absolutely barking mad. The gods of their game, Tendulkar, Dhoni and Kohli, live surreal, detached lives. I've rarely spoken to them deeply because they have become distant figures by the nature of their fame. How they perform under such extraordinary pressure is incredible. When Tendulkar went out to bat, electricity surged around the ground. It felt as if the world had stopped the watch and wait for its portion of perfection. When he got out there, there was a deathly silence, as if the world had stopped turning. Scoring a hundred hundreds under that sort of pressure is an almost unbelievable achievement. My fear of failure drove me on, but what he went through on a daily basis for 25 years is of another magnitude. No one is immune to self-doubt, but he was a prisoner of his genius. The responsibility of pleasing so many so often demanded a barely credible in inner strength. In England, I cherish my freedom to roam as I wish. In India, leaving your hotel becomes a calculated gamble. Before the final game of that one-day series in Dar es Salaam, Ian Bell, Chris Wokes and I went out to a pizza restaurant. The plan involved a slice or two of deep crust washed down by a couple of bottles of Mexican beer as we watched the sun set over the Himalayas. Dar es Salaam is a beautiful place ringed by cedar forests, the air so fresh and clean, appropriately since it's the home to the Dalai Lama and the Tibetan government in exile. It's a tranquil contrast to the teeming cities we are used to visiting. The three of us reasoned that we'd get away with the expedition because we're not instantly recognisable folk heroes in the mould of KP. It was Friday and traffic was strangely heavy. Without exaggeration, our car was surrounded by about a thousand people as soon as it pulled up at the restaurant. I don't know how they knew we were going to be there, but once we were bundled through the crowd, they decided to storm the place. It was absolute bedlam. Armed security guards took us upstairs and locked us in a bedroom where the occupant's underpants were still on the double bed. They devised a secret door knocking code to smuggle the pizza and beer in, so we sat there for an hour or so giggling at the absurdity of eating with guys who were waving guns. And then we tried to leave. I'd never seen anything like it. There were now 5,000 people there waiting for us. The most adventurous were blocking the stairway phones at the ready. They were desperate for any form of contact. It wasn't particularly dangerous, apart from the fact that somebody could have easily been hurt in the crush or during the subsequent stampede after our car. But it was surreal. We never got the chance to relax and enjoy the serenity of the mountaintop. Perhaps there was a moral there. Wow. Don't, it, it, it's not quite the ceasefire that Pele caused, but that sounds like quite the experience. What an incredible reflection on the intensity of fame, especially in a place like India where cricket is almost a religion. I'd probably say cricket is probably number one, maybe religion number two. And it, and it really highlights for me, Greg, that dual-edged sword of fame where players become almost mythical figures and they're rewarded so highly, yet they're constantly scrutinized and pressured. I once heard of a crazy stat that Sachin Tendulkar was part of 25% of all commercials on Indian TV at one time, which is that's amazing. That's, amazing. That's, a cra that's a crazy stat. That's better than any of his cricket statistics. But it, it also brings to mind this notion of fame that while it's glamorous, it can also be incredibly isolating. These players and performers that we have been speaking about 
are surrounded by people all of the time, yet they may live lives of extraordinary solitude, detached by the very fame that defines them. So Cook's captaincy is, is far from easy, and again, he has to make a, a decision on the England career of Kevin Peterson, who, despite his performances being particularly good, he was becoming a distraction in the dressing room and made it obvious that he didn't always want to be there didn't hide that particularly well. So he does make the call to end Kevin Peterson's England career and he delivers the news to him face to face. But the, the, the episode, I guess, does somewhat play out in the media. Yeah, this was a very famous period for English cricket and there's a lot of drama going on. This statement that I've used before, leave one wolf alive and the sheep are never safe. This probably applies to KP and, and his destructive nature in that dressing room that if you leave him in there, I, I don't think the team really evolves. Yeah, it was definitely probably an infamous period of English cricket. But even with Peterson out of the frame now, the dressing room isn't always a harmonious place. Cook says, was the atmosphere in the England dressing room uncomfortable at times? <laughs> you bet. That's inevitable when you have highly competitive people who don't conform to the so-called norm striving for the sort of success that's very public but acutely personal. There were once-in-a-generation players driven by the intensity of the consciously created climate. Of course, there was piss taken, which exists in every dressing room at every level of the game. It's politically incorrect most of the time, often childish, but harmless because it's not vindictive or intended to be taken seriously. Of course, we were imperfect. Of course, there were moments of tension. Jonathan Trott flew at Matty Pryor when he criticised a mistake in the field. Don't you ever speak to me like that again, he yelled. Well, you're fucking fielding for England, mate, Pryor replied. They had a stand-up row, sorted out their differences like adults, and moved on immediately. As captain, I was comfortable with allowing senior players their head in the dressing room. These people cared. It's not a place for tra -la, la innocence. No one walks in trilling, Morning everyone, what a wonderful day. Mockery is delivered in a give-and-take basis. Duncan, is this something that's unique to sport or do we see this kind of behaviour allowed in other high-performance domains? There's a saying that you need different generals for wartime versus peacetime and he's definitely a wartime general at the beginning of his captaincy. You're touching on an essential truth about high-performance environments, whether that's in sports, business, or any other field where excellence is the goal. The intense atmosphere, the pressure to perform, and the drive to succeed often creates a unique culture where directness and even abrasiveness can be part of that kind of daily experience for, for athletes or performers. In these settings, the stakes are high, Greg, and the margins for errors are slim, and as a result, Emotions can run hot and people may express themselves in ways that may seem harsh or unfiltered or unpolitical, as he says. But within these circles, this behavior is often understood as part of the process and a way of pushing each other to reach the highest levels of performance. The key is that this behavior, while intense, has to remain rooted in respect and mutual understanding of a common goal. Couldn't agree more. And of course, leadership only really takes you so far. As a performer, it's up to you to go out there and execute. Cook says, ultimately, success or failure is down to the player. You can't always hold his hand, but there'll be times when you're forced to do so. He must make his mistakes, put his fingers in the fire, and get burned. Graham Gooch, in his old-school way, understood the power of pain. Whenever I made an error in my batting, he expected me to learn from it. The tenor of coaching is changing in all sports. Back in the day, the tell-me coach held sway. Now... It's fashionable for the player to be asked to find the solution. Theoretically, that makes sense because he's in the middle thinking for himself, looking for the answer. But I wonder whether the pendulum has swung too far. Sometimes you just need to be told. The player may insist on personal preferences, but if he's wrong, he must be challenged. It's a balance. The coach has to be strong, but could cause damage if he's misguided. We're back to that common currency, trust. Does the coach have the eye of the batsman, for instance? It obviously helps if he has experience at the highest level. This is a really interesting observation for me here, Dunk. What do you make of this distinction of the tell-me coach and for the case of self-discovery? Where does that balance need to lie? I don't think this is just about sports coaching, to be honest. This can be applied to leadership in general. On one hand, direct leadership, as you're mentioning, where you give clear instructions can be crucial when someone needs to correct a mistake, I would say, quickly. On the other hand, allowing individuals to figure out things for themselves fosters independence and critical thinking, which is essential for long-term growth, as we know. The balance should lie in being adaptable as a leader. It's not about always favoring one approach over the other, but rather about assessing the situation and the individuals involved. A good leader knows when to give direct instruction 
and when to step back and let others learn through their own experience. It's about building trust and understanding individuals and teams well enough to provide what they need at that right moment. I really like that. You've mentioned trust there, and I'll go back to a sentence from that uh, from that paragraph. He says, we're back to that common currency, trust. So, so important in the coach-athlete or the, the, the mentor-performer relationship. I had three months at home before a tour of the West Indies from mid-April. I'd been worn down by the KP saga with its blizzard of unflattering headlines. Even my default position, grinding my way out of trouble, seemed dispiritingly inadequate. I pride myself on self-reliance, but I needed Alice to retain my sanity. So much had happened in such a short space of time, I just unloaded on Alice, and her support was unwavering. I tried to see things from her perspective as we were both coming to terms with the joys and responsibilities of the birth of our daughter, Elsie. Alice couldn't score my runs, chair my team meetings, reply to my detractors. She had to endure my hurt at the relentless negativity. She was on the outside looking in, and I was on the inside, cut to the quick. I had to hunker down and wait for my reward because it was me against the world. And that reward comes in the form of the 2013 Ashes as first as captain here. He said, the Ashes series would be my redemption. No one really gave us much of a chance, but I sensed something stirring during a training camp in Spain. We didn't take cricket bats. We concentrated on slip catching for hours and spoke honestly to one another about our expectations. Scar tissue began to heal. There was no point in hiding from the reality that we'd been humiliated the previous year. Mitchell Johnson was still being spoken of as a major threat. Yet Trevor, in his understated way, cut through the recently formed reputations. He broke down the Australians, both as players and as people, highlighting technical flaws and well-disguised fears. Having destroyed the mystique, he then concentrated on our own outlook. We had nothing to hide and we would have a lot to be proud of. Three days before the first test, we invited the Aussies into our dressing room after the game. Win or lose. Darren Lehman, their coach, refused. We thought it was strange because there was no ulterior motives involved. Their reaction suggested that they were just like us, human beings with inconsistencies and insecurities. We were at ease. We would play without fear and avoid the blame game if anything went wrong. It was liberating. And for the Aussies, disconcerting. He goes on to say, without being selfish, this felt like my team. The scenes, walking around the ground, signing autographs and posing for selfies three hours after the match were the manifestation of a long-held idea. These guys had bought into the principle of reconnection. They were what I had envisioned when I spoke of us being England players 24-7. We weren't faultless, but on that day at Trent Bridge, we illustrated a truth that had needed time to be taken on board. This was an accessible England team. We were bigger than the result, but not bigger than the game of cricket. People saw our human side. We were not robots after all. We were genuine. I felt trusted as a leader, despite getting so many things wrong in the previous couple of years, and trusted the group in return. I looked around and saw individuals who'd given something of themselves. Duncan, sometimes we can underestimate the human element of elite performance, and that connection to one another can actually be the greatest performance enhancer. Greg, I'll get to your question in a minute, but one word that I've just heard repeatedly throughout this podcast is trust. And trust is like a forest. It's a long time growing, but it can easily be burnt down. And right here, Cook is saying that trust is really the bedrock of his leadership. They trusted me. Now, to get to your question about kind of the human element, it's an often overlooked part of elite performance. When a team truly connects on a personal level, they're not just playing for themselves. They're playing for each other, like I discussed earlier. And when people feel genuinely supported and valued, they're more likely to push themselves and take risks, knowing that they've got the backing of the teammates. Like Cook said, he's made mistakes, but he feels trusted. That's where true greatness in performance lies. I love that. Trust is like a forest, a long time grown, but easily burned down. I've heard uh, trust is accumulated in drips, but lost in buckets. I really like that one too. So there's a couple of belters for your listeners. (laughs) So Cook actually begins the book by talking about his retirement. For me, the process began at Edgbaston in 2017 during the final test against the West Indies. I might have looked calm and dispassionate to the casual spectator, but I felt an enormous weight of expectation, an insidious surge of pressure. But getting out for 13-0 and zero to a couple of good deliveries in the first test against India at Edgbaston that summer of 2018 proved to be a persuasive reality check. My mind was finally made up during the third test at Trent Bridge. This wasn't submission to the self-doubt that inevitably creeps in during a running of low scores. It was the liberation of sudden clarity that there was only one solution to the problem. So he goes into his final test. Cricket is one of the only sports where you're primarily defined by your statistics. 
Runs are your currency. And the thought of ending with a pair of zeros in my last test made me more nervous than at any time in the previous 160. I was driven back to the standards I set myself. The fear of failure that spurred me to perform consistently under pressure. That desperation to do well. Dealing with anxiety created by the expectations of people you'll probably never meet takes its toll mentally. Did that process involve a degree of self-worth? I honestly don't know, but I needed to live up to the numbers. I had to dig deep, work bloody hard for every single run I scored down the years. Ambition is double-edged. So Duncan, he goes out after bowling out India for 292. He begins his final test innings, the second innings of that test. I had a simple mental mantra. Don't make this the last ball. It's amazing what you can train your brain to do. Batting is so instinctive and you have so little time to react that movements become automatic. In terms of temperament, I wasn't that different from that young lad who flew halfway around the world to make his test debut against India in Nagpur in 2006, but my technique had improved. I wasn't in the zone golfers talk about, where every event occurs in slow motion and the crowd is a multichromatic blur, but I was at ease with myself. And of course he goes on to make his century. He says sport has that effect on people. Strangers share your life without you noticing, and it's an emotional communal experience. I probably walked off too quickly when I got out that afternoon since Johnny Bairstow had to scamper after me to offer his congratulations. But I felt I'd gone out on the right note. I was in a good place. This wasn't a decision taken out of desperation. Playing for England is all I ever wanted to do and my life was structured around fulfilling that ambition. The transitional period is tricky because one of my identities, that of international cricketer, has been taken away. It was always going to happen at some stage and it's inevitably a hold your breath moment. It takes a while to rebalance your life. And that's where we'll leave it today. But Duncan, what's your top 10 life lessons from Sir Alistair Cook, the autobiography? So our top 10 life lessons from Sir Alistair Cook. Number one, overcoming adversity. Adversity is part of the journey to greatness and perseverance is essential. He said, I had to hunker down and wait for my reward because it was me against the world. Number two, the importance of adaptability in leadership. Leadership requires constant evolution and the ability to adapt to new challenges. He said, this wasn't a revolution. It was an evolution that recognized strengths we hadn't made the most of. Number three, the power of self-reliance. Self-reliance is critical, but seeking support during tough times can be just as important. He said, I pride myself on self-reliance, but I needed Alice to retain my sanity. Number four, the value of reflection. Reflecting on your experiences allows you to grow and improve as an individual and as a leader. In the recent years of my captaincy, I would have been more forceful and proactive. Of course, talking about the incident with Jonathan Trott and his mental health. Number five, the strength in vulnerability. Embracing vulnerability and being honest about struggles can lead to deeper connections and resilience. He said, I just unloaded on Alice and her support was unwavering. Number six, the role of trust in team success. Trust is the foundation of a successful team. Without it, even the most talented individuals will struggle. I felt trusted as a leader despite getting so many things wrong in the previous couple of years. Number seven, commitment to the basics. Success often comes from mastering the basics and maintaining a focus on fundamental skills. He said, Watch the ball. Number eight, the power of mental toughness. Mental toughness is about wringing the maximum out of your abilities at critical moments. He said, the art of concentration is being able to concentrate and then not concentrate on concentrating. Number nine, embracing the human element in performance. Genuine human connection can be a powerful enhancer of performance in any team environment. He said these guys had bought into the principle of reconnection. And number 10, balancing self-discovery and guidance. While self-discovery is crucial, sometimes clear guidance is necessary to correct mistakes and foster growth. He said, sometimes you just need to be told. You don't always have to be a legend. Sometimes you just have to stop being an idiot. So what are the top 10 lessons to avoid from Alistair Cook's autobiography? Number one. Neglecting emotional support. Ignoring emotional needs can lead to burnout and affect performance. He said, Alice couldn't score my runs, chair my team meetings, reply to my detractors. She had to endure my hurt at the relentless negativity. Number two, an over-reliance on self-reliance. 
depending solely on yourself without seeking help when needed can be detrimental. He said, I maintain the facade of strength, but the game regularly beat me up. Number three, allowing external pressure to overwhelm you. Succumbing to external pressures can hinder your ability to perform at your best. He says, that inner voice, a cold, caustic commentator on my faults and weaknesses, piled in on cue. Here we go again, it said. Why are you putting yourself through this mental torture? You've got nothing else to prove. Number four, neglecting the human element in leadership. Focusing on performance and ignoring the human aspect can lead to a lack of team cohesion. He said, we were not robots after all. We were genuine. I felt trusted as a leader despite getting so many things wrong in the previous couple of years. Number five, failing to adapt leadership style. Sticking rigidly to one leadership style without adapting to changing circumstances can lead to challenges. He said, in the later years of my captaincy, I would have been more forceful and proactive. Number six, ignoring the importance of trust. Without trust, even the most talented teams can fall apart. It was a crash course in the value of relationships, which become more interdependent on tour when the captain and coach pick the team. Number seven, allowing self-doubt to control you. Letting self-doubt take over can prevent you from reaching your full potential. My life as a batsman was black and white. If I scored runs, I was a success. If I didn't, I was a failure. Number eight, neglecting to balance instruction with independence. Over-instructing without allowing room for self-discovery can stifle growth. The player may insist on personal preferences, but if he is wrong, he must be challenged. Number nine, failing to address mental health. Ignoring mental health issues can have long-term consequences on well-being and performance. And he said, I fail to appreciate the extent of the problem. Of course, referring back to the situation with Jonathan Trott. And finally, number 10, letting ego get in the way. Allowing ego to interfere with teamwork can hinder overall success. He said, we were desperate to make our mark and didn't allow egos to get in the way. Thank you so much for joining myself and Greg on this episode. If you enjoy it, we ask just one thing. Please share this with two people in your network. And for that, we are truly grateful. See you next time on Performance.